I'm Olive Dickerson. I'm a retired professor from the University of Alberta, and uh, I was a history professor. And my, uh, my latest book, which is the uh, Canada's First Nations, was first published in 1992, and it's out in the third edition this year. When I first started to work in, in Aboriginal history, the reaction of the professors was, well, what on earth do you want to work in that area for? Because you, there's, no, there's no historical evidence. The Indians were an oral people, an oral society, and without written documentation, you can't have history. <laughs> that, that was the attitude. So, so, that, <laughs> so the, the question arises, what is history? And uh, the, uh, the answer, of course, is that history is how we view ourselves, how we view ourselves in relation to ourselves, our own persons, in relation to our communities, in relation to our country, in relation to the cosmos. Meet Olive Dickison, renowned journalist, Aboriginal historian, single parent, grandparent, and author. As a middle-class girl growing up poor during the Depression, she had no idea she would come to change the face of Canadian history. But she did. Her books, huge and encyclopedic in their scope, are Canadian bestsellers, and they're changing the way Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people view their history and their country. When I think of Olive Dickinson, I'm thinking of a, a person such uh, who, who is a leader, an academic, a historian, a person of unique value, uh, bringing together a, uh, the, the non-Aboriginal world with the Aboriginal world and making a, uh, making the next generation a little bit more fundamentally aware of our true history, of the, of the contribution of Aboriginal people. Non-Native people tell their history from their perspective. They have not been in uh, our boots to tell our particular side. That's one of the wonders of uh, the magic and the importance and the significance of all of Dickinson's work is that she's telling it from our perspective. And that's how she was able to write uh, a PhD about Canada's First People. This had never been done in the country before, as I say, because it, First Nations were beyond history, they were prehistorical, and she has brought them into the mainstream of Canadian history. She wanted to immortalize our history, who we are, where we came from, where we might be going. That, to me, was her real intent but inadvertently, she is more immortalized. Born Olive Williamson in Winnipeg, Manitoba in 1920, she was the eldest daughter of a British-born accountant, Frank Leonard Williamson, and Phoebe Philomena Cote, descendant of Francois Cote, who came to Canada from France in 1634 to settle in the West with his Aboriginal bride. Olive would spend much of her life only vaguely aware of her Métis heritage. But when her well-to-do parents went broke in the 30s, the family wound up trying their hand at mink farming in northern Manitoba. To beat starvation, Olive's Métis mother taught Olive and her sister how to live off the land through the ancient ways of fishing, hunting, and gathering. But for Olive, the need for food was only one form of hunger. She yearned to know things, all kinds of things, and she soon found a way to begin her academic education. Molly and her sister went from a life of of relative luxury and and convent education and music lessons to up north where the nearest neighbor was miles away and they had only themselves and as they got a little older they walked the trap line 
And uh, at the end of the trap line, there was a man lived alone, a bachelor, and he had a lot of books. And he was very kind. He would let them go into his house and warm up and borrow some books, and then they'd bring them back on the next trip. Luck is the best thing you can have in life. Better than brains, better than anything. <laughs> have luck. Because up in the woods, uh, living in the, in the woods, there had been a remittance man, Bob Hamilton, who had once been a government official in Scotland and had brought with him a, an extensive classical library and uh, subscribed to you know, the London Times, the London Observer. And so he would spend hours with us and that I was reading Marx and Plato. He was a classical scholar. So though I only had grade 10 education, I could discuss the, the, the Greek philosophers, the, <laughs> you know, the, 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 what Marx thought on certain subjects, and uh, I just was extremely well informed in, uh, due to uh, the Scottish refugees' influence. World War II broke out in Europe. Olive, then 19, went south and found a job going door to door selling magazine subscriptions. But her talent for turning difficult situations into opportunities would bring her to another life-changing meeting, this time with a priest in Wilcox, Saskatchewan, a man known for helping poor kids get a university education. In southern Saskatchewan there I began hearing about this incredible priest, Athel Murray, who was, he was a, a, the most spiritual man I have ever known, ever encountered, it. a remarkable person. But he was a maverick. And in those days, southern Saskatchewan, where the boondocks, between the depression and the drought, it was in a very bad way. The kids just couldn't go to school because they had nothing to wear. And so Pierre took a, one look at this situation and harumphed away and said, something has to be done about it. By the time that Olive appeared, Father Athel Murray, or Pear as he became known, was a local hero who had pulled together a boxcar college where local boys could reside and study in converted railway cars. As more money became available, so did buildings. He was soon able to open his school to girls as well. He was both charmed by and protective of his young protege, Olive Williamson. We said, you know, she walks like an Indian. Meaning, because she wore moccasins quite a bit when she first came. That was another strange thing about her, you see. And uh, Pear called us over. Some of the boys had said we were not being very nice to this new girl. So he called us in and talked to us about that. And he said, supposing she were the Christ. I got home, we kind of looked at her. She had long black hair, and she had the high cheekbones, and she had the sort of ascetic look, you know, and skinny as a rail, as we all were at that point. And we thought, you know, she does sort of look like the pictures of the Christ. Well, so I think we warmed to her quite a bit more than just in case. <laughs> The smallest thing I can say about him is that he gave me my life. He gave me my life, because uh, I, I, I just wouldn't have stood a chance otherwise. You made it. <laughs> I would like to acknowledge a very special Notre Dame alumnus. Pear saw in her the beginnings of greatness. Her tremendous work in the writing of the history of Canada's First Nations has been a major academic achievement. As she has been honoured, so has Notre Dame been honoured. Ladies and gentlemen, Olive Dickerson. She made it by herself. She's smart. Smart. She looked at everything. She could recognize art. You know, the rest of us who theoretically had more education in those fields would just look at her blankly because she could say, Oh, that's a Monet. No, I think that's a Manet. No, it's a Monet. Monet, you know? And she could tell us why. And, and even more esoteric artists than that, she would recognize from afar that's a so-and-so and so-and-so. Notre Dame College, through its affiliation with the University of Ottawa, 
granted Olive her first degree in 1943. Then followed a marriage, three children, a divorce, and a career in journalism at the Regina Leader Post, the Winnipeg Free Press, the Montreal Gazette, and the Globe and Mail. And always there was great financial struggle. But after all this, Olive once again needed to reinvent herself. Without so much as a glance at the fact that she was now in her late 40s, and at a time when most people would hold on to their security, Olive decided to cash in her meager pension fund at the Globe and Mail, pay off her debts, and start over. With Father Murray's blessing and backing, she moved to Ottawa, where she began attending night classes at the University of Ottawa, while working during the days as Public Relations Director for the National Gallery of Canada. Well, I first met Olive Dickerson as a student uh, at the National Gallery of Canada. I, I can remember being very impressed with this lady, uh, very professional, she spoke with authority, she knew her business. She had a sensitivity towards, number one, towards the art, but towards other things as well. Uh, it was much later that I was to discover that she did indeed have Native heritage. Olive herself only discovered her Aboriginal roots as a young adult when she went out west to visit her mother's side of the family for the first time. From then on, as a journalist and as an editor, she explored Aboriginal issues wherever she could. But none of it would prepare her for how the subject of Aboriginal history was viewed in the academic world. I uh, went back into the university and I was absolutely shocked when I got into the classroom and heard these professors talking about the savages who, who were, and, uh, and all the good things that the Europeans brought them and uh, you know, they, that, that these people were locked in time, they hadn't progressed, and, and on and on. So uh, I realized then I would just simply have to um, put my efforts where my, my, my mouth was and, <laughs> and get it into it. 